Okay, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be in the world. Thank you very much for joining us. Welcome to the latest in our series of FIP Insider webinars. Uh, I'm delighted that more than a thousand people have joined this series overall since we started running it, and I'm delighted to say that we've got another fantastic turnout today with around 300 people registered. Thank you very much as ever for your support. Last week we looked at the FIP Global Digital Subscription Snapshot with our guests from Solera One and Axel Springer, and we'll be posting a link into the chat box for you to download this report for free if you didn't already do so. And this week's webinar is very much a continuation of the same theme. We're going to be looking at how you can use data to be more effective in your digital subscriptions marketing with a particular focus on pricing strategies, something that came up uh, in last week's webinar as a question from the audience. And it was definitely an area that viewers wanted to know more about. In a moment, I'll be introducing Martha Williams, my co-host for today's session, and she will introduce you to today's guests from Mather Economics and The Atlantic. Now, to make the most out of today's session, you should also download a copy of our how-to guide to paywalls, which Martha wrote for us recently. A link to download that will be appearing in the chat box. We're publishing that with the support of our partners at Zephyr. If you're looking for a new approach to dynamic paywalls, then please do, do go and visit their website, which is zephr.com, to learn how they can help you. The forthcoming relaunch of the FIT website is being built around Zephyr technology, so we can certainly recommend it. Now, before I introduce Martha and then she can introduce her guests, let me run through some housekeeping items. Today's session is a Q&A, and we're very keen to hear from as many of you as possible. If you look in your webinar controls at the bottom of the screen here, then you'll find the Q&A button. Go in there and you can submit your questions and you can also upvote other delegates' questions and make comments on them. There's also a chat box. You can also access that from your webinar controls and you can use that to chat either privately with myself and the other speakers or with the other attendees. And we'll be keeping an eye on that throughout the event. I recommend that you keep it open because the FIP team will be posting comments and useful links throughout. Now these events and the work that FIP does to share knowledge across the industry would not be possible without the support of our corporate partners, PressReader, one of the world's largest digital content distribution businesses, and UPM, the world's leading Biofor company. We thank both of them for their support. I'd also like to thank FIPS members for the support that you give to the organization. We wouldn't be able to do any of this without you. In July, we're going to be putting most of our content behind a members only wall on our website. So if there are those of you who are not members and if you want to continue making use of the knowledge and insight that we provide, we would encourage you to join. Membership starts from as little as 50 pounds per month and you can contact me on james at fip.com for more details on how to do that. Tomorrow, you'll all get a post-event email with a link to the slides, a link to download the report and details of our forthcoming webinars, including some links to sign up for those. Next week, we have a webinar on e-commerce, looking at how InStyle have turned this into a significant revenue stream. And on Thursday, we're, we're joined by senior executives from Dow Jones, another FIT member, to get their take on media pre and post crisis. Details of all of these are on the website, www.fip.com and we will be in the uh, and of course they'll be in the post event emails we look forward very much to seeing you there right that's enough from me i'm going to hand over to my co-host for today's session she is a digital media industry author speaker and consultant and has been involved with a wide variety of media businesses and industry associations i'd like to give a very warm welcome to to martha williams hi martha and over to you Hi there, thanks James so much for the introduction and thank you for your partnership. We're very happy today to present a very topical um, uh, webinar for you that is all about revenue making during the COVID crisis. Why? Because there are some significant industry um, incidences right now having to do with advertising and subscriptions um, that, that necessitate us to change our strategy. So um, today we're going to have some great speakers um, uh, talking about price optimization um, for our subscriptions uh, in the time of COVID. Um, we're going to have Dr. Matt Lindsay, who's the president of Mather Economics, the preeminent subscriptions company for media. 
And we'll have Sam Rosen, the SVP for growth uh, from the Atlantic speak to us about their case study about price optimization for the Atlantic. Uh, once again, thanks for everyone's partnership here. And I'm gonna dive right into why this is important right now. And that is because there is a huge plummet um, of advertising, both in the news media industry and of course the magazine media industry. And as you can see from this trusted report, the Myers Report, um, a think tank on uh, advertising the media industry, you can see that there is um, in um, printed newspapers um, a 42% drop um, during, um, during the beginning of um, uh, uh, the crisis uh, from the previous year and uh, in digital an 8% drop, whereas for magazine advertising, that is consumer print um, originated advertising um, for magazines, it's a 38% drop year over year and a 12% drop um, for digital. Now, meanwhile, something good is happening. And that is there is a surge in subscriptions, both in print and digital. Here's an example um, generously uh, given to us uh, to show from um, Jellyfish, the uh, UK magazine uh, media company. Um, but basically what they're doing is looking at UK magazines and how print subscriptions are uh, surging during lockdown. The, the time frame we're looking at right now it, on the screen is March 23rd through 26th of April. And you can see that the, the largest surge happened when the lockdown started, um, but it is sustained um, as, as time goes on. And these are year over year numbers um, from 2019 to 2020 um, during that same period. Now, coinciding with this trend is that there is a record-breaking year-over-year magazine content usage pattern. And as you can see, there's gigantic leaps in the amount of year-over-year -year, uh, content consumption in all of these different areas, starting with kids, a 500% increase, home and gardening, 400% increase, women's co content, 325%, and news and current affairs, 231%, and so on. Uh, year over year from March 23rd to the 26th of April. And coinciding with that as a corollary to the content usage, now there's a huge uptick in uh, subscriptions um, in the UK. And of course, this trend is happening all over the world, according to our sources. Um, basically, uh, here you see um, gigantic leaps in subscriptions for tech and gaming, 268%, family and home, 259%, uh, women's 177% increase in subscriptions. And, um, and this is in the UK once again, but again, we're seeing this all over the world. And the reason this is important is because we can take this trend, look at what's happening with our advertising and try to maximize our, um, our uh, revenues by maximizing subscriptions through optimizing our pricing uh, strategies. So here today, we're going to be talking about that very topic about maximizing our, our revenues by optimizing our pricing strategies. And here to talk to you about the science behind this, these techniques um, is Matt Lindsay. Um, who, once again, president of Mather Economics. Take it away, Matt. Great, thank you very much, Martha. Um, I'm gonna share just a couple of slides and uh, while, sorry, I hit the wrong button. While we are uh, doing that, please don't hesitate to jump in with any questions that you may, uh, you may want to have uh, throughout. And I realize that uh, slides are not particularly uh, the purpose of this meeting, it's more of a discussion. So I wanted to, um, you know, please encourage you to, to, to jump in and, and ask any questions through the chat box. So I'm just gonna really go through a few slides very quickly. And there's really a couple of primary ideas I'd like to share. One is that there's uh, in the middle of this COVID-19 crisis, there are some, uh, of course, some major changes to subscription activity occurring in the market as Martha described. 
uh, essentially the, the number of subscription sales is growing tremendously. And that's really happening for a number of reasons. One, there's just a lot more visitors to the site. And then second of all, the ones that are being presented with a subscription offer are converting at a much higher rate. So we will be sending this document out to all of you. Uh, so please don't, uh, you know, don't hesitate. I'll go through these fairly quickly, but just to give you some, some ideas of how these things are changing over month, we've updated this report. So the dark blue lines are what happened March over February. And then the, the, the light blue is what happened April over March. And we're about to present another update to this. So we'll be happy to share that as well. Matt, uh, Matt could you switch your screen to the, to the main? You, we're, we're seeing the speaker notes. I wonder if you could switch to the, uh, the main slide screen. That's it. Thank you very much. There we go. Sorry, my apologies. So uh, again, just a, a number of metrics here. And, and again, the, the core story is that number of subscriptions are, are up significantly, as well as the overall engagement of sites. So, but there is an interesting analog to what we've seen previously with spikes in demand. And that is that if we look at a, another event that occurred in a U.S. city, uh, and we've seen this in response to political uh, events such as the election in 2016, we've seen it with respect to sporting events or uh, sports victories. This, is, this was actually after a Super Bowl win. And so you can see in this particular city, there was a spike in, in news demand and it actually increased subscriptions substantially. However, after the demand was over, there was a drop in, in, the, in the actual number of sales. And so what we've learned through these activities is how you can anticipate this drop and what to do about it. And the, the short story is that what happens in these spikes is you're actually converting people that are already in your sales pipeline. You're accelerating their conversion. And so you need to actually refill that conversion pipeline. And there are things you can do with that. And there, there's also, uh, pricing implications for this. You should really not be offering a dramatic price, you know, incentives during this particular time. You should reserve those for afterwards. So that's the first core point. And again, happy to answer any questions you may have uh, on that. But the, the second primary uh, point of this session was to just really briefly share uh, the science a little bit behind price discrimination or price pricing strategy. And so there are a lot of numbers on this slide and I won't, I won't go into detail other than to point out that if we were to compare a, a targeted pricing or a more strategic pricing strategy to an essentially an across the board strategy where, and we're focusing on renewal pricing in this example, that the targeted pricing will usually yield a tremendous amount of more incremental revenue from a price, from a price rise or price increase at renewal. So in this example here, about a, almost a 40% additional revenue from a price action that's, that's applied in a more scientific way. And so how do we do that? So the, the key point is to understand what's your price elasticity look like among your subscribers. And this is a, con, this is a, a distribution of, of price elasticity for one of our clients. And you can see that there's, there's a, a pretty significant range of price sensitivity across your subscriber base. And there are people on the far left that have very low price sensitivity and people on the far right that have very high. And as you often will hear, there's the 80-20 rule as an effect that 80% of your price related stops will come from these people that are the, the bottom 20% of your, of your subscriber price elasticity distribution. So the solution is not to give everybody the same price increase, which would be represented by the flat line, but perhaps to maybe uh, not give people on the more sensitive end a price increase or maybe give them a lesser increase and then give the people on the top end a slightly higher increase. And there's different ways to do this. The second concept is to A-B test these. And, and A-B testing is something we do uh, for hundreds of our clients. And in this example here, just to share what this looks like is we actually hack, asked a client to have a holdout group. So when they had their, average, their annual increase, uh, which they did as what we call business as usual was everyone received a 5% increase. We just asked them to take out a statistically representative sample. And when we compared the performance of the target group that received the, the increase to the control group or the holdout group, what we see is that that 5% price increase caused an incremental 9% stops among subscribers in their first year. However, that same increase had a far smaller increase, less than a half a percent, uh, stop rate for people that are in their uh, fifth or greater year of subscription. So just understanding tenure alone gives you a tremendous amount of insight into who's most likely to stop following an increase. The, uh, the other uh, concept is acquisition. You can actually uh, use similar types of analysis. If you predict the ultimate lifetime of a, 
subscriber, what we find is that when you rise, pr increase or lower price, you're essentially getting a, a, a different type of subscriber on average. As you'd expect, a, a lower price offer will bring in people that are more sensitive to price and also much more likely to churn for a variety of reasons. And so when we look at what's the optimal price, we can use a lifetime value framework. And in this example here, we've actually showed that this particular client could increase their total expected lifetime value by dropping their acquisition price slightly. And this is really my very getting close to the end here. We know that pricing is somewhat, pricing strategy can be somewhat of a, uh, a sensitive topic. And so there's different ways to apply pricing strategy. You don't have to do it at the customer level. You can actually do it at different degrees of aggregation uh, by product or by customer segment and then, or by customer itself. And we can actually uh, measure the trade-offs in, in, in pricing yield versus uh, segmentation granularity. And my, my last slide is really this, that in this era of switching platforms from print to digital, uh, pricing strategy can actually help you extend the, the life, the, the run rate of your print product revenue and give you time to make a, a true digital uh, transformation of your business if that's ultimately where, where you're heading. In this example, you can see we've actually uh, kept uh, revenue flat by raising the average rate and mitigating the loss of print subscriptions. So that, that in a nutshell, just uh, these two slides are just about us. Uh, we, we work with many customers in the publishing industry and there's about 45 of us and most of us are economists and data scientists. And uh, I would be happy to share this and other reports with you uh, anytime. So please feel free to, to contact me uh, and I'll be happy to retain, return these documents. So with well, that, thanks. I'll, have, I'll trade it off and give it back to you, Martha. Well, thanks, Matt. That's fabulous. And already questions are coming in. So that's something that you may want to take a look at. Meanwhile, we want to ask um, to hear, hear from, from you, um, at, from the Atlantic, why don't we go ahead and start with your presentation? We don't have any slides for you, but um, could you please give uh, give it a start? I'm sorry. Yeah, I got no slides. Uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm out here in in Brooklyn. You know, we've lost all access to PowerPoint and Google Slides. Uh, part of the pandemic of being in in New York City. Um, so. You'll just have to bear with me blabbing on for, for a little bit. I'll give a little bit of context of kind of where we've, where we've been and where we are now overall from a subscription standpoint. I'll talk, I'll talk a bit about uh, price testing and, and optimization, but mostly hope to just uh, be able to hear from y'all and uh, have a fun and lively conversation. So we had a fairly traditional uh, subscription model up until September uh, of 2019. Um, we offered mostly uh, print and digital, uh, print only, and we had a sort of a modest uh, digital only package where before we launched a meter on the site, uh, it got you access to the PDF and, and other small perks. Um, but we knew that we had to shift our strategy to uh, get ahead of what no one had any idea was going to happen in the advertising market. Um, and so we, we, we ended up pushing back our launch a little bit because uh, some of the, and I'm sure this is tr just as true uh, across the world as it is in the US, but some of our legacy print systems um, we felt weren't gonna allow us to move as quickly. And so we spent a period of time uh, kind of working with and around our, our, our legacy systems and, and partners use Stripe um, as our credit card processing uh, and, and tried to kind of modernize our, our technology infrastructure as much as possible. Um, and, and so when we launched in, in September, we launched with a note from our editor in chief and uh, kind of a, a big hurrah on, on the website. And it was incredible. We blew all of our expectations at, out of the water. Um, we had developed a fairly sophisticated, complicated model projecting, you know, paywall stops, uh, conversion rate uh, by nudge, which is, you know, sometimes called the growler, but it's the thing usually at the bottom of the screen that tells people how many articles they have, they have left. Um, and, you know, by multiple uh, digits, uh, we, we exceeded our, our expectations and then, and then fairly quickly went into more of a business as usual state, still uh, exceeding our kind of modeled expectations 
probably by double on a, on a monthly basis, but sort of we're seeing a, a leveling out in terms of our, our acquisition on, on the site. Um, and then in, in March, everything exploded in the world. Uh, everything also exploded in our business and, and on the subscription side, um, it was explosive growth in a, in a really powerful way. Nothing really changed about our business model or strategy. Um, we got a lot more aggressive about uh, email marketing. Um, we wanted to make sure that everyone was aware that we were putting a, a good amount of journalism um, outside of the meter. So that was uh, available for free. And so our editor in chief was, had been sending emails every couple of weeks, letting folks know about that. Um, but we, we reported on this publicly so I can say it. So we had about 37,000 subscribers in um, March and certainly our, our, our single best month since, since September uh, and pre-September, you can't really compare to it because uh, it was a completely different business model. Um, the way that I kind of think about why that is happening is in, in addition to so many people working from home and, and being totally freaked out like all of us about the fate of the world, it's, you know, I just sort of say it's the journalism stupid. Um, our, our journalist kind of rose to the moment in a way that had us all in awe. Um, we had major features from, from a Brit, our, uh, uh, Ed Young, our science writer. Um, we had lots of really strong political argument and, and reporting. We actually started uh, a project that has become open source called the COVID Tracking Project, which has been sort of a de facto reference point for, for a lot of uh, broader tracking, tracking efforts. And, and so it, it was pretty extraordinary, the support that we saw. What's been um, equally extraordinary is that uh, those numbers have, have mostly stayed uh, consistent from a subscription standpoint, even though traffic, we're, we're still kind of beating our record month every month, but in April and May, the traffic hasn't been quite as high as it was in, in March in sort of this explosive moment. Um, but but uh, our, our subscriptions have stayed uh, really, really high. And so we're seeing the same numbers that Martha and Matt were, were presenting. Um, we've tripled our, our daily paid media spend on Facebook and, and Instagram, Twitter, Google. And so the big question is, and this is where I'll uh, transition a bit to pricing is, you know, how long will will the demand that we're seeing continue and how will all of these kind of COVID era, post COVID era subscribers behave? Will they be as loyal as, as not loyal? We don't really know because we've stuck to uh, annual pricing for now. So we don't have a monthly option. We uh, haven't launched significant discounting like Matt was, was saying. We, we feel like as long as we're seeing this amount of demand with an annual package, um, why, why, why potentially cannibalize that um, when we know that annual is, is going to renew at such a higher rate? Most of these folks are in, in auto renew. There's, I don't know if, if, if anyone on this uh, webinar is familiar, but there's something called GDPR. I can't, I can't see if anyone's laughing, but that's obviously a joke. Um, we're all very familiar with it. There's also the California auto renew. So um, that has made that auto renew picture a little bit complicated. Usually that's the best predictor that someone's going to um, renew. Uh, but, but, but we're going to stay steady with, with annual for now and, you know, kind of pay attention to, to demand. In terms of how we got to the kind of pricing that, that we currently uh, have, it's, it's for the most part a, a doubling of, at least at the, at the introductory level, at the entry level for our digital only of what we had been offering. So we had been at 25, we're now at 50. Um, print and digital had been at 35, it's now at, at 60. Um, and the way that we got there was we, we did a Van Westendorp study. Um, we worked with Piano's consulting arm to, to perform that. And uh, we, we asked a little bit about kind of features and which features people would have interested in, interest in, but it was mostly looking at how do we think about annual and monthly pricing. Um, some, some, of, some of what we got back from that qualitative research kind of hewed to our expectations. Some of it was pretty, pretty off. Um, I think for the most part, the digital and print and digital, so we're about 
um, 60, 40 folks who are doing digital only versus who also have uh, print in their, in their uh, bundle. Um, the uptake of premium was, was well below what we saw from uh, a survey standpoint. So we, we thought that a lot more folks were gonna be paying for our $100 premium product than, than ended up paying for it. Um, that, that said, uh, we knew that the demand for that was gonna be low and we wanted to keep it anyway because if that meant that we would increase demand for our print and digital, which was a higher um, price product, uh, and, and actually even more profitable and led and, and made the digital package more uh, appealing then we were comfortable with a lack of, of kind of significant adoption on the premium side. And like I was saying, we have a, a ton of legacy subscribers, um, you know, before launching our, our metered paywall. And so one of our biggest goals is how, how we, we call it the, the path to price parity, which is, um, a nice alliteration and it's a mouthful to say, uh, but, but so getting to price parity, having our legacy subscribers uh, be paying the same amount as our, our new subscribers kind of post paywall. Um, we worked with, with Matt and the, and the Mather team to do a dynamic pricing model. I will say that Matt's one of his later slides that was showing that you could do it by cohorts and segments and not doing it down to the subscriber. I think the first file that we got uh, had like thousands of different price points and we're a small team and we were like, this is great guys, but I don't think we'll quite be able to accommodate that many prices, especially, you know, working in our kind of legacy system. So we simplified it. We looked at, at, at tiers of, of individuals, what they're paying, tenure for how long they've been with us, whether they're in auto renew or not, um, and, and a lot of those other variables. And the test has been really successful. Um, we're, we're continuing to go with the, with the dynamic pricing model to try to get everyone up to, to our, our, our new prices. Um, we know the demand curve is not gonna last forever. Um, and so I think the, the question is a little bit more when, not if we will launch monthly and, and kind of trials and, and do lots of tests there uh, to continue to be able to, to, to grab, grab demand. Um, but, but for the moment, um, we're, we're really happy. I mean, honestly, we're bowled over by the uh, support that we're seeing and just the demand for people paying for journalism. And so um, I would say overall, we're, we're happy with our pricing strategy. And then obviously over time, over the next three to five years, um, we don't necessarily want to stay at the same price. And so there's going to be a lot of, of testing. We'll test, um, you know, what, what it might look like uh, for different bundles to be the same price, different prices, et cetera. Um, and so, so there's a ton and ton of AB and multivariate testing to do. Um, but so far we feel like our, our business model and strategy has been working. I'll stop talking there. I ran hey, out of words. Thanks, Sam. Much appreciated. We already have some questions coming in um, for you. And I guess one question from Steve Yeager is very appropriate at this point, And that is, what is your annual subscription rate? Subscription, what, it, what do we mean by rate? Cost, price. Oh, okay. I think that's a UK, US thing. I was like rate of growth, rate of... Um, so, so annual print and digital is $60. Digital only is $50. And then our premium, which has uh, ad free and a couple of other perks uh, is 100 Sam, how did you come to that price in the first place? Was that based around, were you using print as a reference for that originally? Or would, was it something, I mean, obviously you tested it a lot, but you had to start somewhere. Where, where did the starting point come from? Yeah, I mean, I think we, we knew that, that when we launched our, our metered paywall, we didn't want to keep prices the same. We also knew that we didn't want to sort of do a race to the bottom and just try to get as many subscribers as possible. I think that the um, magazine media business for understandable reasons has been, uh, I mean, I guess it depends on your niche or sector, but, um, you know, somewhat of an arbitrage game from an advertising standpoint of getting lots of low cost subscribers and then selling them to advertisers at a higher clip. Um, we all know and have seen what's been happening in the advertising industry. And so from the very beginning, we sort of had a spectrum of on, on one hand, pure scale, on the other hand, pure kind of average order value or lifetime value per subscriber. So if we wanted to go for pure average order value, 
you know, and didn't really care about our total number of subscribers, we might have launched with something like $100, but that would have been a quadrupling of our uh, uh, entry level product. Mm -hmm. um, we also certainly didn't want to reduce price because even though that would have gotten us, you know, hundreds of thousands more subscribers, probably, we know from lots of data. One of the nice things about being a little bit later to the game is that uh, we can learn from everyone else's um, opportunities for learning. I won't call them mistakes. Uh, and so, um, so that was kind of our strategic context that we wanted to optimize for, for revenue and subscribers kind of equally. Um, and then through our Van Westendorp study, uh, what, what we saw, so Van Westendorp kind of creates, creates cliffs of, of pricing where you can um, offer different pricing for different packages. And then you see what seems to be a psychological barrier at different levels. And so for, for us, we really saw the $50 price point. That was a, that was a huge cliff um, mm -hmm. in terms of expected demand. And so we felt, you know, doubling our original prices, but not, but, but we didn't feel comfortable enough um, ignoring the data to, to the degree that we thought could really kill our, our demand, um, yeah. not in kill in a good way. Um, and so, so we hewed pretty closely to the Van Westendorp. Um, we went a little bit above for, for print and digital. Um, it, the model mostly had demand be equivalent, uh, maybe a little bit down if we priced above, but there are costs of delivery. And we also um, wanted to signify the value of, of our print product. And so we just went $10 above uh, for, for print. And the other thing is we eliminated print only. So we only have, so we silently con converted, upgraded all of our, uh, print, not silently, we let them know, but on the back end, we converted all of our print only subscribers to print and digital, um, and then stopped offering that on the website. So we, we knew that we didn't wanna have a print only product um, anymore. Um, I will say, cause, cause I know that this was uh, potentially gonna be a question that I just remembered, the whole, the whole question of pricing monthly versus annual. My, my philosophy with qualitative data is that it's, it's good to give you signals, but it should only be directional. It shouldn't be too prescriptive in terms of your strategy. And so one of the really interesting things that we saw from the Van Westendorp was that when it came to monthly price, so people could say, do you wanna pay for the Atlantic annually on a monthly basis? And so of those who, who selected monthly, and then of those who, scored a four or five who said that they would be likely to pay. So we only looked at the folks who said that they would be likely to pay, not the folks who said that they might or probably wouldn't be likely to pay. Um, when you converted to, to, when you looked at the annual folks, there was a massive price disparity. So, so the monthly folks said like, oh yeah, $10 a month sounds totally reasonable. And then the annual folks said, no way we're paying more than $50, $50 a year. <laughs> and uh, uh, some, some quick math, as I'm sure many people are doing with their kids at home during homeschooling, um, would reveal that there's a significant disparity between $50 a year and $120 a year. Um, and so, so even, even as we think about launching a monthly product, we're mostly going to ignore the, the idea that folks said that they would be super comfortable paying $10 a year, because our feeling was that that was just their gut kind of reference point for Netflix and Hulu and mm -hmm. other entertainment that they're paying for, but that we should take more seriously how they see the annualized cost of a subscription to the Atlantic um, and use that as more of a baseline for how we might think about monthly pricing. Hmm. You know, that might be a really good segue um, to a question that came in before our webinar started from Nat Geo. Um, it's all about pricing and, um, and models. So um, this person would like to know, is there research or testing analysis that explores pricing models in relationship to content type? Um, now, both of you can answer that from both of your perspectives, but what this person means is print versus perhaps the Netflix model or Spotify model. What models have you chosen, Sam? And, and Matt, what's the science behind choosing the model for pricing? Um, I'm not totally clear on the question in terms of content type and model and then pricing. Um, the, I mean, or, and, or, or if they're talking about like 
politics, uh, you know, culture, that kind of thing, or just? Um, I think it was more that they were, they were, they were keen to understand uh, why, whether or not we are thinking as an industry with a with our kind of print hat on still do we still oh. use the print magazine as the reference point for our pricing should we not be looking at the netflixes of this world as the reference ah, okay yeah that's helpful um so i think i think it's sort of yes and no or both and or um uh whichever imp improv metaphor we want to use um in 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 a certain sense what we found in our, all of our qualitative research is that we can't really avoid the perception of The Atlantic as a magazine. Um, especially we knew that a lot of our initial subscribers were gonna be folks who had known about The Atlantic for a while, probably skewed a little bit more in the you know, 40, 50 uh, and above uh, age, age demographic. And so those are folks who grew up with print magazines and who have a mental model for uh, what a magazine should cost. And even looking at, you know, so we don't charge as much as the New Yorker, um, the New Yorker being at, I think now 48 times a year versus us being at 10 times a year. Mm. Um, in a perfect world, we, we, we would not have to consider print frequency and print, um, the, the, really the print magazine in terms of how we price. Um, we are deep believers in, in print as a model and we, we love the print magazine. We think that it provides um, a, a great opportunity uh, for, for people to engage with our journalism in a really tactile way. So we're very pro print overall, um, but we also knew that, you know, it would also be great to charge a Netflix rate um, or to, to, to charge, you know, out of the gates what the, the New York Times was charging. But, what we, what we didn't want to do was underestimate people's psychology and their mental models for what you should pay for a 10 times a year magazine. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, we were I think we were largely right. I still stand behind that, that, that thinking. And so hopefully over time, um, as, you know, as, as what we do is more about kind of magazine journalism and not um, only tethered to a pricing model uh, that's tied to a 10 times a year print magazine, um, we'll be able to increase our prices and, and, and we're definitely gonna test the, the levels of elasticity and inelasticity, not from a renewal standpoint, but from an acquisition standpoint, where we would start to depart from the 10 times a year print magazine um, mental model. But, but certainly you know, for our first six to 12 months of launch, um, we, we wanted to be realists and know that folks are, are thinking, um, are doing the mental math to think about uh, a 10 times a year magazine. That said, from an editorial standpoint, you know, we just think of ourselves as One Atlantic. Um, obviously, the print magazine has a longer runway. There's more uh, uh, care and editing that, that, that by nature has to go into each article, but we're also publishing you know, we think of ourselves as publishing magazine quality journalism on the site every single day. And we also are publishing lots of uh, digital only features like what I was talking about from Ed Young and um, stories from, from Jim Hamblin um, and Applebaum who, who um, has written print features for us. And so from, a, from, a, from an overall business model standpoint, we just think of ourselves as kind of a magazine journalism brand and, and publishing magazine quality stories. Um, but from a pricing standpoint, uh, I think it's hard to avoid the, the, the connection to print in people's psychology. Let me add a quick thought on that. So our, our, our experience is that in acquisition pricing that you're, you really don't have as much knowledge about the customer, obviously. And so that really it's less about targeting at acquisition. It's more about uh, managing kind of the, the flow of, of subscriber starts. And then once you have them in your database and you can observe their behavior, you can then have a lot more sophistication around their, you know, expected price elasticity. Uh, some, uh, one of the questions that came in was a brand new, uh, a long-term print product that is initiating a digital subscription for the first time. What's the right strategy for that? And what, what we recommend is that you don't necessarily, the, the first subscribers that you'll get digitally are likely going to be your most engaged and most fanatic, you know, fanatical kind of readers. And so price is not going to be the motivation for that particular segment. 
we find people subscribe typically for four four reasons, and this has been verified in other research. There's there's certainly the cost component, so how much is the price, but there's the community uh, aspect of it. There's the content, and then there's the cause of journalism. So people people will be motivated for different reasons. Only one of those is typically price. So we recommend starting with a fairly high price that has some relation to your print product, usually not as much because there's a perception that I'm, I'm not getting a physical product. Um, and then don't, I would, I would also just to the point on Netflix, I, I think there's people's minds, there's a pretty significant dis difference in their perception between a product like the Atlantic and Netflix. So I don't feel like you have to, you know, feel like you're competing with Netflix in a pricing context. Yeah, totally agree. Martha. Yeah, I was going to uh, to say there's a number of questions out there from you all, and please keep them coming. Um, James is going to field these uh, these questions, um, and uh, uh, take it away, James. Um, okay, no problem. Great. Thank, thank you. you to I, mean, I should say I'm sorry. Thanks to Sam and Matt very much for your presentations, and please stand by for the questions. Great. Yeah, I think uh, we've got a, we've got 15 or 16 on here, so we'll see if we can get through all of them. Uh, Top voted question, what percentage of your new clients, I guess this is a question for you, Sam, what, per, uh, what, question of your new, what percentage of your new clients subscribe without hitting the paywall? Did that percentage change during the pandemic? Oh, that's a great, that's a great question. Um, I'll, I, I can't see everyone, but I'll, I'll just trust that if I start, the data that I start to give that y'all won't tweet it. So I would ask, I would ask you, not to. I know that we're not in Chatham House rules here, but um, yeah, we we yeah. will be for the next two minutes while you talk. We will be great. Thank you. Um, yeah. So we're so so in any given month, our our we call it our gateway. So the true kind of paywall um, uh, will will convert uh, probably at least a quarter of our of our subscribers um, and uh, our our nudges um, are are also I think a similar amount. I don't have all the data in front of me right now. Um, but, but we also see like repeat gate wall hitting, a gateway hitting um, is, is a really important indicator of, uh, of uh, subscription propensity. Even just like people subscribing in a single day, reading two articles in a single session is most correlated with subscribing in a single day. And so, um, you know, our, our North Star is habit and getting people back to the site multiple days in a 30 day period. Because um, it means that they're engaging with our journalism. It also means that they'll be more likely to hit the gateway or to hit the, the paywall. Um, but we've been surprised. I mean, our, our, our nav bar uh, is directly attributable for about 30%, uh, tw anywhere between 25 and 35%. So the nav bar is sort of in any given month could be equivalent to the the true paywall the gateway itself um in in direct conversions wow that's amazing so there's people yeah, I, to me that that sort of signals the the amount of folks who are subscribing out of support out of the cause of journalism where you know if they're not being forced to subscribe so to speak um and they're just compelled emotionally then they're probably going to hit the 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 subscribe button in the in the nav bar I don't know whether you or all, Matt have any data on this. It just occurs to me. I, do, you, do you know whether there's a proportion of people who arrive on the site wanting immediately to subscribe? In other words, they know before they get there that that's what they're going to do and they just want the shortest route possible to sign up. They've, they've made their decision offline and they're coming back to the, to the site to do that. Yeah, I mean, we definitely have a percentage of folks who uh, convert on our first nudge, for example, who come to the homepage and, and convert. It's not as high of a percentage, like generally the, the, the closer you get to the gateway, um, so like nudges four and five, the fourth and fifth article that you read in the meter convert a lot better than nudges one and one and one and two. So there's a correlation to repeat usage and, and propensity to subscribe. Um, but we certainly see folks come and, and you know, subscribe uh, either their first session first day. It, the thing that's hard to know is is because of the the cookie world that we live mm. in. How many folks are actually have come five times, but then just like bought a new iPhone or using a different yeah. device um, and subscribed. And so we don't put too too much stock in 
new new visitors or like first time subscribers. We more try to look at the patterns of the relationship between kind of habit, repeat usage, and subscription because we also mm. think that that's the more sustainable way to go about our our strategy. Yeah, sure. I'll just um, add a quick. Uh, Hmm. Spark on there. We we find that that over half of the subscriptions in a typical website come from things other than the the paywall. That the the there there's email you know newsletter click throughs. There's email you know offers that the pay. But I will say this that the the other interesting fact is that most subscribers hit the paywall multiple times before subscribing, yeah. often as many as seven to ten times. So hmm. uh, just because they hit it and they bounce off, it's not necessarily a bad thing. We, it's, it's funny you say that, Matt, because we basically, I think we found that like 12 is a drop off point where if someone hits the paywall 12 times and they're probably not going to subscribe. But from about three, from about three to 11, it goes. So the first paywall, um, this is a, this is my slide. This is conversion rate. So <laughs> first, you know, first paywall hit is maybe here. This is zero. Second is here. And then third is like up there. And then it sort of, it sort of stays, stays there. And then once you get to 12 or 13 gateway or paywall hits, then it starts to drop off because you know those those folks probably either they're bots or they're not as likely to to subscribe. Mm. Um, Matt, I have a question for you from 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 Rory Brown, who's asking whether you've done any work on price elasticity for corporate B2B accounts rather than individual subscriptions, and interested to know whether you see the same trends there. We have, yeah. Generally, B two B subscriptions are even less price elastic than than consumers or B two C subscriptions. Uh, there are some what we call firmographic information, which is the parallel to demographic information. You can look at firm size, you know, uh, industry vertical. You can uh, also look at there. There's there's a lot of times there's corporate you know site licenses. So very much able to you can you can do some price you know customer segmentation and pricing you know strategies for B two B. Absolutely. Um, I, then I have a question here from uh, Ashish Thomas, uh, one of our members in an Asian market uh, based partly in Singapore, partly in the Philippines. He's asking in a market, and this is maybe a, a hypothetical question for you both to think about um, uh, using your experience. In a market where there are no subscribers or players who have uh, no digital or negligible digital subscription play, which is largely the case in Asia where there's very little print reference to base it on, um, how would you benchmark price points for a new subscription service? I mean, just kind of circling back to, to what we talked about earlier. Matt, I'll let you take that one first. <laughs> so, of course, you know, to, going back to our earlier discussion around your own print product is probably the most significant benchmark. I, I think there are other, uh, you know, global brands that people are, are mostly aware of these days. So you'll see often the New York Times or the Financial Times or, the, you know, other just the Economist magazine Generally, there's a there's a sense of what the uh, you know people are aware that are likely to subscribe to online products. They're, they they have some sense of what that looks like. Um, and again, earlier what I mentioned earlier is that you know getting the the first price out of the gate is I would err on the side of higher price because it's always easier to go down than it is to go up. So mm. I would uh, and also the people that you're most likely to convert right out right away are are your most your most engaged readers. So. Typically, start somewhere close to your print product, and then offer, uh, dis, you know, discounted offers or incentives as as you start to plateau your new subscriptions. Um, I'm just gonna I'm gonna step back a little bit from pricing and ask a couple of questions that have come up in in everything we've done so far around monetization and different business models. And um, the first one is around the the balance between advertising and digital subscriptions, because I think it'd be interesting, Sam, to get your view on this. Is it the case that with a, a, a digital subscriptions approach, such as the one that you guys have implemented recently, that you have to give up on your digital advertising? Can you create a balance between the two in your in your in your no, revenue model? No, no, no. I I I, I would say, um, if anything, having more digital subscribers uh, will will help from an advertising standpoint because it allow it gives advertisers an opportunity to engage with subscribers. I mean. One of the things that we've been seeing sort of as it, incoming requests and interests from, from brands is they're aware that uh, media and journalism is kind of moving towards a subscription first world. And so they've actually been inquiring more about different ways that they could possibly sponsor exclusive content or mm -hmm. a really nice experience for, for our subscribers. Um, and so there are kind of two levels. One is, bespoke 
partnerships that we've been talking about with, with advertisers that allow them to reach our subscribers who are, you know, most, our most engaged folks. And then the other is looking at um, what's typically called yield optimization. Um, so, and that has to do a little bit more with, with programmatic revenue, but um, figuring out how we kind of optimize our page so that uh, we're, we're not just balancing, but, but actually optimizing the amount of revenue that we're making between advertising and consumer revenue. So we certainly don't see the two in, in conflict on our end. That's partially, you know, we have a metered, we have a metered mm. paywall. So there's, there's not a question of kind of behind and in front of the paywall. And given, given that we're a larger site with, you know, tens of millions of, of uniques every month, um, you know, we have a, a the majority of, of our visitors are one and done or, you know, coming not more than two, two or three times. And so we're still able to reach the vast majority of our audience from a page view and unique visitor standpoint um, uh, within the first three or four articles that we're reading. So we certainly saw some programmatic advertising loss. Um, it because you know folks who are now getting cut off at the fifth article maybe would have read 30, 40 articles. Mm -hmm. So there's gonna be some page view loss there from a revenue standpoint, but the profitability of subscribers from kind of more of a holistic view um, definitely more than makes up for that. Yeah, I, I would add, we, we do a lot of those types of, of calculations for clients and, and what we've just, to Sam's exact point that a, a subscriber is a stream of rent revenue that we can forecast. And so what, what we do find is there is a, there's an optimal balance between how much content you're, you're putting behind a, a premium wall or a paywall just, and, and we, can, we can help you determine that Generally, as the as the you know the CPMs of ads have declined over the past few years, that has that's argued in favor of more subscriptions and tighter paywalls, and that's certainly certainly what we're seeing in the market. Uh, the, a good question here from AJ Mishra. Thank you, AJ, for this. The flip side of price, of course, is acquisition cost. Mm -hmm. um, what's a good benchmark for acquisition cost? How do you think of that? I mean, and you talked earlier, Matt, yeah. you talked about lifetime value. I guess it's, it's, it's probably a metric that you use as well, Sam. What do you think about in terms of benchmark, benchmark acquisition cost for subscribers? Yeah, so, so we're, we're early into our new pricing strategy at, and, and you know, we're not even at a year long renewal. Um, we're, we have a, our renewal moment is gonna be September 5th of, of this year. So kind of on faith and knowing benchmarks, we're, we're doing a um, three year, uh, so we, we take our average order value across all three bundles mm -hmm. um, and then take kind of a blended, we'll, we'll, we'll test out between kind of 75% and 85% retention as, as an assumption. Um, auto renew digital subscribers are gonna be much more in the 80s and 90s. Um, uh, print subscribers are not going to be quite quite as quite as high, and so right now we're we're uh, a CAC a cost 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 per acquired customer. Um, we're we're kind of doing three year with, I, and I forget where it is in the seventy five to eighty five percent retention rate, but we're accept we're considering that an acceptable acquisition cost, um, and and we're currently running a holdout test um, for all of our paid media to see. Uh, what, that, what the actual incremental value is. Um, that'll get more sophisticated over time. Our data science team is building uh, a more nuanced lifetime uh, value model of different packages, uh, you know, geo, et cetera. Um, but, but we were comfortable launching with a more crude kind of three-year LTV with some basic um, retention assumptions in there. And are you going to announce volumes at any point? Have you done that so far? I hadn't seen, I couldn't see anything. Announce what, what number of subscribe number of digital subscribers that you've got. Ah, uh, we may, we may. You might. Uh, Good. I we mean, I mean, you know, we're we're so we're we're audited by the Alliance for Audited Media, so folks can generally see. You know, whenever those reports come out, you can you can see our subscriber file. So we yeah. we won't really be able to hide it uh, for long. But I think the next AAM statement wraps in in July. So. Um, we, we may, we may uh, announce that or just, you know, let, let the statement speak for itself. I think uh, you'd, be in, you'd be in good company if you were. There are very few magazine brands that have done that yet. 
and it would yeah. be, be really good to be the, the kind of leader in there. I want to ask a question from Lucy Kuhn, uh, uh, who's a frequent contributor to Fit Things and, of course, uh, very well known in, in, in this world. She's asking, uh, you say that the caliber of journalism was decisive for the Atlantic's current success, but how did you build the link between the business and the editorial sides when you, when you implemented this, the paywall? Did you develop principles and guidelines to help those in the newsroom focus their work? So how did you build the Washington Post? I know I've talked a lot about the connection between the two. Have you, have you done something similar? Yeah, I would say, I would say our, our newsroom actually developed sort of its own principles. I mean, in one sense, I could be glib or flippant and, and say the principles were kind of identified 163 years ago when, when we started. And that is true. I mean, there, there are certain things being of no party or click. Um, th there was a quote where we said that every uh, print issue would contain at least one article that was to be the plowshare that would break up the old fields. Um, and so, so there is a lot uh, just in our editorial DNA itself, but um, our, our newsroom kind of identified how they wanted to approach this such a significant moment. Um, and, and that one of the really happy things that we find is that our data and our uh, editorial ambitions are totally supportive of one another. So we don't have one of those uh, classical, almost like caricature situations where <laughs> the growth team is saying, we got to do more cat videos. And then the editorial team is saying, what are you talking about um, in a, in a subscription-based model for a, a brand like, like the Atlantic? Um, what we found actually a hundred percent of the time is that the stories that we, you know, most wish to that people would say like, yes, I'm going to pay to get stories like, like these are the stories that, that people actually convert on and, and pay for. So we certainly have, you know, we, we talk a lot, we, our data science team shares lots of data, but um, I, I would say that our newsroom itself sort of has identified um, mm. the types of stories that it thinks are the most Atlantic-y, as we say, and, and the most valuable to, to readers. Fantastic. It's great to hear. We're running out of time, so I'm just going to do two questions to close with. We've managed to get all the way through without asking a specific question about COVID and coronavirus, but I'm going to do it now. Have you had to be, this a question for Sam, have you had to be cautious about how you treat COVID and coronavirus related content in terms of both pricing, putting offers around that uh, and, and, and making it explicitly paid or not paid? I mean, is that something that's featured in your decision making? Um, so, so our, again, the newsroom from an, just an ethical and moral standpoint, wanted to make sure that um, you know, any story that really felt in the public interest um, could be non-metered. And, you know, we, we supported that from, from a, a business standpoint. And so even today on the site, um, we're, the, the newsroom is continuing to put uh, stories each day um, outside of, outside of the, the, the meter. The thing that we've done, or I should say haven't done from a marketing standpoint is I just personally felt sort of weird around capitalizing on coronavirus mm. as, specifically as like a marketing platform. Mm. And so I, I've, I've wanted our marketing team to stay away from mentioning it too explicitly. Um, we do have on all of the stories that aren't metered so that don't count towards your, your monthly uh, kind of paywall allowance, if you will. Um, we have a, a message at the bottom that's dismissible that says, this is part of, you, you know, you're reading the Atlantic's free coronavirus coverage. So we at least wanted to make sure that people were aware and had the opportunity to support us. But um, we've, we've, we've generally found that doing, doing that uh, has created so much goodwill. People have come out and really wanted to support us. Um, and again, like I was saying earlier, there's, we, I feel very lucky, but we, we, we almost never find tension between any data that we're seeing and sort of what what the newsroom feels is is the appropriate thing to do. So, um, you know, we would have made that decision anyway to, to put stuff outside the paywall or to not meter it. Um, but it's also a really happy coincidence that uh, all, all of the signs point towards that being really smart from from a support standpoint, too. Fantastic. Uh, one last question for Matt. Uh, from, a, from an anonymous person. Did I understand correctly from Matt's presentation that we should charge more for our most loyal and tenured subscribers? 
but shouldn't we give our most loyal and tenured subscribers the best deal? So this, this is a great question. It's very counterintuitive and uh, I was waiting for this to come up. So uh, thank you for the anonymous person that submitted it. So uh, yeah, it, that, that does sound counterintuitive in, in a lot of ways. However, what we find is that the, the most price sensitive a customer will ever be is right when he's experimenting with your product. So he's, he's not a, your product's not a part of his, uh, his daily routine or his habit. And so there's also some uncertainty as to what the value proposition is for, for those new readers. So Normally, that's why we say start, if you're starting a product, a digital product, start with a higher price because those people are usually the ones that have invested in your product and, and they have that relationship. Then as you, as you acquire new subscribers, you reach a plateau, acquire people that are on the fence, and usually you want to remove price as a barrier for that entry. And so the goal is to give people somewhat of a, of a price, but if, as you trade a price, oftentimes what we ask for is a commitment in terms of term. So Sam says, as he's rightly done, started with annual subscriptions because when you drop the price, you, you increase their churn risk. So um, you, you've seen like big brands like the New York Times, they're, they're now offering quite aggressive, uh, you know, $1 a week type of offers. Uh, and and there, there's an understanding that they will move to full price. Um, but yeah, they're really the ones that tenure is, is one variable. Uh, certainly what we're trying to do is match the price to the value proposition that that person's receiving from your product. Fantastic. Uh, we're going to wrap up there. Martha, any last thoughts before we do? No, just thank you to our wonderful speakers and to FIP for putting on this really useful webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to Sam and to Martha and to Matt. Thank you for your contributions. Thank you to all of you for watching. You will be able to see a recording of this webinar on our YouTube channel, which you can find at youtube.com slash fitworld. That'll be up in the next few days. You can also follow us uh, on Twitter, uh, at FIPWorld, and I'm at FIPCEO. If you want to uh, also learn the latest from FIP and find out when we're doing more of these webinars and more of our content, then do subscribe to our newsletter, which you can find on the, on the website, FIP.com. We'll be back on Tuesday with a session on e-commerce. We've got uh, representatives from Tipsa, leading e-commerce technology company, who are going to tell us about how InStyle have transformed their uh, business through e-commerce revenues, a very interesting other form of monetization. Apologies to all those of you that we weren't able to, to get to in terms of questions. We will try to answer some of those uh, as best we can on email and in the post-event report. You will get a post-event email tomorrow with details of everything that we talked about today. But in the meantime, thank you very much for joining. Thank you and good afternoon. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye -bye.